we spent one and a half years uh, bootstrapping the company. So we were like super slow at developing it uh, and wasn't selling it until like 18 months down the road. And oh, wow. then so like, we did it in better metrics. It's just like sitting there waiting aggressively for people to put in their credit card, right? And it yeah. just doesn't really work because you need that feedback to say like, is, is our messaging correct? Do people get the pain? Do they yeah. have the pain? What's extremely important in the pre-selling part is to ask for the money in the app. Because yes. you get the real truth there. Like, do you do the transaction right there? Like, yeah, well, you know, put it okay, in your so car. How, okay, we have not had success with that. Welcome back, everybody, to the Founders Corner. Today's episode, I have a very, very special guest. He has been in the game of SaaS for more than 13 years. He's the founder of the coolest name I've ever heard, Digital Wasabi. Yes, it is very spicy. His name is Christian Jorgensen, and he is here with us today. Christian, welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here and definitely ready to share some truth bombs here. I love it. Now, just uh, just so we can properly place you, you are actually not in North America. You are in? I'm in Denmark, so Denmark. Copenhagen, Denmark, which is not the capital of Ikea, which some people <laughs> would assume once in a while. <laughs> so Isn't Ikea little Sweden? Uh, Ikea is Swedish, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So right. we're neighbor to Sweden, so that's why people confuse it sometimes. <laughs> no, I now Denmark to me is is the red flag. First of all, a blue red that's very different. So I don't know how people confuse that. But um, I've actually seen pictures of Copenhagen, uh, and 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 there's a lot of you guys love bikes. There's a lot do, of bikes. But... Yeah, yeah. For how cold that place is, I don't understand it. <laughs> it's actually not that cold. Oh, I would okay, say, it's not but... that bad. But true, it's it's a real uh, like a real challenge for a lot of tourists to understand like like where are all the cars like you're yeah. just going around on bikes yeah it's super fast and you know it's one of my easy. one of my profs uh, who is uh, who who still like I'm very much connected with I talk to him all the time his wife is actually Danish um, she's from Dan uh, Denmark as well. And, uh, that's how I know so much about Denmark and how yes. it's very different to the other countries. So I love it. <laughs> I love it. Chris, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm actually very excited to have this conversation with you because, you know, uh, you not only come from a founder's perspective, you also have a digital, uh, marketing company that helps startups with, with outbound. And uh, and bringing inbound naturally, and you have 13 years of SaaS experience, which is huge, right? So you know, I I want to first start off with what do you see in founders, and what like if you're talking to a brand new founder who's you know probably listening to this, kind of going, I want to take the plunge. What is the number one advice, and and what do you tell them right off the bat? So first thing they would, any entrepreneur basically, SaaS or not, would need to learn super quickly is to get super good sales skills. Uh, so because you don't have a company until you have revenue and hopefully profit as well. And you need you need to sell to start doing that. And what is profit? I, I, I don't know what this means. Making money. <laughs> I mean, no, I just yeah. mean most startups, they, they definitely are not thinking profits. They're thinking, what's the next raise? That's their profit. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Which is, uh, so actually that's that's an interesting uh, angle because when I was visiting San Francisco like eight, 10 years ago, and mm -hmm. I heard all these American startups pitch, pitch me their product. And I asked, I was like, yeah, we're going to do the new whatever, Twitter or something. And I was like, What's your revenue model? And they were like, we don't have any. We just need <laughs> users. I was like. Scale we, at all costs. That's our strategy. Exactly. <laughs> and if, if you then compare that to the culture that we have in Denmark, where you have a ton of bootstrapped uh, SaaS companies, mm -hmm. that, that was like a, a massive like black and white difference right there. Right. And I do notice that like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of difference between Europe and the U.S., Right. Like European startups are quite uh, like I want to call them resourceful. Right. Like they are very resourceful. They are very smart about how how they target uh, companies, like how they scale because they don't have access to the cash that the U.S. does. Right. 
So, True. um, so I, I'm, I'm going to love this conversation because you're going to come in from a perspective of you don't need all the capital in the world to raise it. Right. So, okay. Yes. So, so yeah. So <laughs> you tell them you have to be a sales led, uh, founder. Okay. What else? Yeah. Because you know, the whole challenge with raising money all the time is because you, you maybe create a product and you have no idea if there's actually product market fit for it. And then you spend a lot of time developing it. And, and then you're like trying to sell it after maybe a year down the road, you burned a lot of VC money, yeah. uh, but you haven't been practicing your sales skills versus if, if I was to start a SaaS company tomorrow, I wouldn't write a single line of code. Like I would literally go first of all on, on like a pain hunt, uh, which I like to call it. So it's like really hunt. figure. Okay. Is that an actual thing or are you making that up? Oh, that, okay. That's, a, that's, you're like kind of making your own thing. Okay. So you go under, like, find the people who are feeling the pain. Okay. I got you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you can find that pain, pain in two ways. Like you can either just research online, look in yep. LinkedIn groups, Facebook Reviews. groups, whatever. What yep. are people complaining about? Right. Yeah. And, and that's like a super effective way of finding those pains and then creating some kind of prototype and then pre-selling that basically. Do you know what I tell people in my workshop? I always say like, go to the review sites and I, you don't look at the five, you don't look at the four, right? And what you're trying to do, or sorry, you don't look at the five and you don't look at the one. Cause the ones, they're very unhappy. The twos are, or sorry, the fives are like very happy people. Ones are very unhappy people. So I always tell them to look between the three and uh, the two and four to understand because they get productive, right? They'll say, Oh, I like this, but I don't like that. So I love review sites. So I'm with you on that one. Okay. What else? Sure. So, so the reason why I'm, I'm super focused on the whole pre-selling part was in, in our own SaaS company, better metrics, we spent one and a half years, uh, bootstrapping the company. So we were like super slow at developing it, uh, and wasn't selling it until like 18 months down the road. And oh, wow. Then so, like, so hold on. You guys didn't start selling it 18 months. Like that's because of the development because it took that long to build. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was a pretty long process and, and I was coming from a background where inbound, I had scaled uh, several in, SaaS companies with inbound marketing before, uh, yeah. literally from like baby steps to exit and yeah. And then I was like, you know, that's going to be the tool in my toolbox that I will use for this because clearly, I mean, we have a great product and I know mm -hmm. how to run paid campaigns, do content, all that jazz, right? And <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so, so we started sending people into the onboarding flow, signing up for trials and it happened. We had like hundreds of trials coming in, but my challenge was that they just died in there. Yeah, like, you, you couldn't convert. No, absolutely yeah. not. I, I yeah. was expecting, you know, Stripe to just be like ding, 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 ding yeah, every yeah, morning yeah. when I woke up <laughs> and didn't really happen. So, um, why do you think that happened? I'm just curious because everybody has yeah. their own reasoning, right? Like mine would be the fact that like, you know, maybe it's a more complex product. So it's harder to just have a trial and someone just wanting to get on it. Sure. So, um, so the product, what it was solving was like pulling data out of Facebook ads, Google ads, and so on. And like preparing all that data so you could report on it, combine it with your CRM data and oh, so on. Okay. Um, so what the I realized was hard. Like, off, what's our, what was it? The setup was hard. Both the setup was yeah. hard. They needed to like authenticate their Google account yeah, Facebook yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. And, and then what I found out once I ditched that strategy and started making uh, like LinkedIn outreach and cold calling people, they were, they were giving me the real objections, which ah. were like, how can I trust you with my data? Uh -huh. like, so, so what was um, happening was people were signing up because they did feel the pain. They, they were struggling with it. But the underlying issue is, I don't know if I can trust these guys. Ah, yes. and you really didn't understand that until you actually started picking up the phone call and actually calling them. Interesting. Exactly. Very That's why I want to reverse the, the whole flow process, and just start yeah. with the selling part. So you get those objections first and you, you actually understand 
how are they solving this problem today if they are solving and and is it a big enough pain or is it just like a nice to have thingy that we yeah. are developing um yeah but you get that on the sales call the, the, for sure so in in this podcast i've openly like we we have emma um who's our marketing um vp of marketing at corridor um and she came up she turned I'm going to say she coined the term, uh, but a product advisory board. So creating a product advisory board, which is basically going and talking to 10, 20, 30, whatever amount of customers you want to talk to, who are you building something for? And literally saying, hey, I'm building this. Can we talk? I just want to hear you out. I just want to talk to you. What are you thinking? What's your biggest struggle? How? Are you? Because I, I feel like a lot of people are actually willing to help more than people think they are. Right. Like if you're Absolutely. building something for me, like I'm going to tell you what I want so that I have that solution. Right. Um, yeah. And a, a lot of founders, do you find that are very secretive about their project as if it's like the next billion dollar idea? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, some go more like in stealth mode, but and we have a, maybe a bit of tendency to do that in Denmark because we have some very like deep tech um, companies coming out and they cannot mm -hmm. like show too much. But I think people have gotten better and at, to, like just drop that stealth thing and just yeah. just just what it is you want. Um, we actually did that part with the product uh, advisory board. So I had like five, six people in it, but it was actually nice. only one of them that was an ICP, like so like the deal uh -huh. type of customer that I would yep. like to have in the company. But he was definitely challenging me, <laughs> like like just going through our sign-up flow, like this, you're scaring the shit out of me right here. Like, <gasps> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just like, why don't you sell through agencies or like just challenging our distribution? Um, was it productive or was it counterproductive? Because sometimes it's like, you know what I mean? Like there's some times where you're like very productive. You're actually helping me build it up. And then there's the other times where they're the, the comments they're making is like, oh, seriously, like, I, I don't know how you want me to respond to that. Like, I feel like I, I, I had a, I had a good advisory board. They were okay. really challenging me, really pushing me like in a like, good way. Productive. One of them way. was just like, dude, you just need to go and get those first five customers. Yeah. I was like, hell yeah, you're right. Yeah. And then I just focused everything on that. Uh, like yeah. drop the like having the product perfect um and just go and sell it so so for founders you're you're this is a nice lead up to what i want to where i want to take this is so your your suggestion is that anytime a founder comes to you and says what can i do to be a better founder your your thing is go sell <laughs> before you exactly. even start coding yes. Yep. You, need, you need the revenue to pay for the bills. Yep. You need you need the sales skills to require. Uh, sorry, to recruit the the best people. And oh, absolutely. Then once yes. you, you build up the team, then and you want to scale. Maybe you want to get some VC money, and then you need to sell again just to the venture capital guys. It and is true. It's, it's just yeah. one big sales process. Yeah, you are you are consistently selling no matter what. Like you're selling yourself, you're selling the brand, you're selling the passion, you're selling the the product, you're selling the team, you're selling yeah, you're right. It it is nonstop selling uh as a founder. And um, then you need to be also that like you you're going to be the most passionate guy about your product because you didn't, you came you up with be. it, right? You should be. Yeah, yeah you should, hopefully you should be. <laughs> so, you're also going to be an inspiration to your entire sales team on like how you're right. pitching it and sh like passing all on that passion. Uh so that's super important as well. Yeah, true. Um so what is and since you're the expert here I want to hear your thoughts. What you're like? I don't know if I'm calling myself own name. No, <laughs> Let, let's be let's be humble. It's okay. Um, let you know. A lot of founders go into um, developing a software. The, a lot of founders essentially what they do is they say, "I got this. It's gonna blow up. I know it. I'm gonna just build it out." And the first month, like you said, people are gonna just. I'm gonna be just. It's it's going to kill it. It's going to crush it. Why does that never happen? Oh, there's a lot of factors. In, in that one. <laughs> I would Let's say stick to the important parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say let's pretend first, product is perfect. Let's say they truly hit the mark 
with the product. Okay. Why? Yeah. Then, then, then it can be like that your messaging is just off your, or you're targeting the wrong people. You have the perfect product, but it's just, you're telling the wrong people out on the market about it. And then, then you're going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, if, if they don't get the value that your product is delivering because your messaging is off, yeah, then you're going to fail as well. Yeah. So you can have the best product in the world. I think it was the, the founder of Loom who was like, the, 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 it was like iteration number three, like pivot number three, where they yeah. really hit it because they were like, we developed this like thing for doing customer service. That wasn't what they were looking for. Then we pivoted and pivoted again. I always and tell them. Yeah. I always tell founders, I'm like, you need to get really comfortable with pivoting. <laughs> Cause that yeah. happens way too often. And it, it's fair, right? I, I think, I think it's also because of the fact that most founders don't take the proper approach at the beginning, because in my opinion, it's the whole concept of uh, design twice or was it, what is it? Measure twice, build once, right? Whereas okay. most people, they don't do the measuring. They just build, right? Sure. It's like, I'll just build it and then yeah. they'll come. Um, what is the difference? So for, for most founders, maybe this is not as clear. What is the difference between inbound and outbound sales? Since we're talking about the fact that they have to be good salespeople, what is that difference? What is inbound and what is considered outbound? Sure. So inbound basically covers a lot of tools in the toolbox, which is like creating content, blog posts, uh, running paid ads on Google, Facebook, doing PR, whatever that attracts people into your uh, company where you don't need to go out and knock on the door to, right. to open the dialogue, right? Outbound is, is the complete opposite. You being out there and knocking on the door. Um, yeah. So what, so why does inbound never work at launch? Because we always have founders that are like, yeah, I'll just do inbound. It's all good. I'll just throw a bunch of ads at this and we'll figure it out. Why does that sure. never work at a startup level? Because you, you don't get that feedback loop of yeah. uh, talking with your customers. Like you, you literally have no clue what's going on unless you're like, I don't know, Twitter, but I'm pretty sure they also had like oh, they, they did, yeah. customer is like research and just pulled some people into the office and said, what would you do here? Right. Um, but they pivoted twice, I think Twitter oh. and then they went to Southwest by Southwest in Austin. And that was, uh, they put some boards up with like live tweeting. So anytime that someone tweeted, it showed up on the board and that's really what it took. <laughs> Because it, it originally it was built around the the concept of just simple, like I'm here, I'm there. That was the sure. whole point of it, and then they kind of pivoted towards more of a conversational uh, piece. Okay. Sure. So, so uh, I mean, we we did it in better metrics. It's just like sitting there waiting aggressively for people to put in their credit card, right? And it yeah. just doesn't really work because you need that feedback to say like, is, is our messaging correct? Do people get the pain? Do they yeah. have the pain? Uh, what, what's stopping them in this entire process? And once you've had enough of those conversations, fair enough, you can add the inbound part to it. Um, but I would always to this day start with outbound. So a lot of founders find that in uncomfortable. So what are some of the strategies you would suggest for someone who is about to embark on outbound? Because again, there's a lot of times where like founders, in my opinion, if you put them in the room, they're terrible, but introduce them to someone, they're very good, right? That's um, nice. And that's just a comfort factor. I get it. Like I've been there as well. Like I can't, I hate going up to random people and having a random conversation, right? But put me in the room and introduce me as this is a pair and this is, you know, Christian, I'll sure. talk your ear off. I'm totally good. I feel comfortable right off the bat. So what sure. what are some strategies you would suggest to a founder who's not so comfortable about, you know, potentially like randomly going and talking to a girl at a bar, for example? You know what I mean? That's I always sure. use that as an example, right? Yeah, if you can no. go up to a random girl and talk to them, you'll be OK in sales. But if you can't. <laughs> figure out how you're going to do it because you're going to need it. Sure. So I, I have a, 
a few approaches to to tackling this one. First of all, like what do we want to do in our startup is first of all measure our our success or lack of. Say like you know how many how many qualified leads that we get in this month, how many meetings and how yeah. many customers. So like just tracking that in a simple spreadsheet. So and and what's your expectation? Like I want to have ten good meetings this month, mm -hmm. and right now I'm at one or zero yeah. maybe that's just going to be screaming in your face especially if you Start have a advisory small. board or something that that you told this these targets to and then you'll be like next time you meet what happened right so there's right. some pressure you can create around yourself uh, for that and then my my other approach is it's an extremely self-shaming approach so if, <laughs> if i like create... that self-shaming good <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the, the mind twist that I'm using is you created this amazing product. It solves a real pain out there and it will save people a ton of money, a ton of time. Um, but if you're not going out and selling it to them, presenting the, it to them so that they can buy it, they will keep doing things in a very stupid way. So you're uh -huh. doing them a massive disfavor. So like By not shame talking. on you for not fixing, you know, right. the problems out there, right? It's a complete twisted way of doing it, but it can be, you know, a trigger if you're really persistent and like, oh, I right. cannot do sales. Yeah. I, I actually really like that shameless way of doing it. Um, and I think one thing I'll always say to founders, I mean, tell me if this is a good strategy or not, um, but I take the approach on the factor of, you know, when you're going and talking to someone, don't approach it as in, I'm going to immediately sell you something. Go present it as, I'm providing you some value. Whether you go with me or not, I'm totally cool with it, but I just want to give you this value, right? Yeah. And that really takes the pressure off cold calling because I feel like most people, the way they approach cold calling or even a cold approach is that they have to close it. Right. Like it's like you immediately have to, yeah, you immediately have to close that deal. Otherwise you're, you're weak or you didn't do well or, and that's the sign is like, you have to make sure they part with their money right off the bat. Whereas I kind of take the approach of relationship building and I take the approach of, Hey, like, I would love to just hear your feedback on this. Like I, I built something. I'm just curious. Does this look good to you? You're kind of like my ideal customer. Like, how can I sell this to you? Yes. Right. And it's more of a conversation rather than a sales pitch. And exactly. I love those conversations. If someone tries to sell me like that, I will have those conversations night and day. If someone tries to sell me with, uh, you know, I always get these outbound email or sorry. Uh, yeah. Outbound emails where it's like, here's some, uh, here's some thoughts. And then they go, the second email is thoughts question mark. I'm like, what do you want thoughts from me for? I have no engagement with you whatsoever. Like go yeah. away. Right. Whereas if, if, if it was more of an approach of like, Hey, this is what I'm noticing in the industry. And this yeah. is my thoughts on it. Do any of these relate to you whatsoever? I'll respond to those. Cause it, yeah. it's a conversation, right? It's not a, you're trying to pitch me something. Not yeah, I completely agree. Completely agree. Like the whole like asking for feedback on the product is like one approach or just like how basically the inbound marketing uh, strategy as overall is that you're like bringing people a lot of value in the hope that that they will then later convert, like fill out a form and you can get them into an email flow and give yeah. them more value. And then eventually they're like, wow, these people are the best. Like what is that product they're selling, right? That's yeah. basically inbound. Um, right. So really agree on just over delivering value what are your challenges um or I, I guess i should say a lot of listeners are probably going to sit there and say well okay fine cool i like to pre-sell but how do you pre-sell without a product that's question number one Good question point. number two is how do you counteract challenges um that are being presented to you from the customer side of being oh uh i wish you had this i wish you had that because let's be real, we're startups. Everyone, anyone that comes to you and says, I'm a startup, I'm, I just built this product. No one should have the expectation that it's a fully fledged product. Yes. But yet they do. So I'm just curious. So one, how do you pre-sell without the product? Two, 
how do you sell the product that's not necessarily at its 100% yet? Sure. So pre-selling basically comes back to to uh, like you can you can do it in a super simple way. I mean, especially in now 2023, like you you have Figma, you know, just pull up a clickable prototype. Uh, mm. Like I literally, the, the interesting thing was that I was actually doing that just like a Google slide with screenshots of our product in better metrics. I wasn't showing the real platform. Yeah. I was just showing them screenshots like, oh, this, this will, this is the first thing, then this happens and boom, magic, you have all your data, right? Is that interesting? Yes or no? Great. Yeah, to be honest uh, with you, most people won't even recognize that's not even a software yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and and now in we have access to all these no-code tools and you can pretty easily spin up some fairly functioning uh, tool that, that yeah, it looks doesn't have a to be pretty. pretty. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But you can just go with <laughs> yeah. Slideshow or Figma or like something. Keep it super simple. Get that validation of, of like, is this interesting? Yes, no. Would they buy? I would ask in the end. Okay, so will you buy it? Yeah. And then we get the real objections, right? Yeah, Which I like is that. what you mentioned before, like you're missing this feature or this feature or this feature. Um, and it's, it's a super tricky balance because uh, you can be pulled in all kinds of directions. In, in our case, it was like, we need Snapchat integration. We need WooCommerce integration. Yes. All kind of shit, yep. right? All um, kinds. All kinds. <laughs> and so, so our approach in the end just ended up with being, we go for what 80% of the market needs and they need like these six platforms to integrate right. with. And then we're just going to stick with that and make the product better. Uh, and that, that we did for a while. Uh, yeah, so. you do. You do have to learn, especially in an early stage, you have to learn to say no to some customers. Yes. Because customers can overwhelm you. And it's, I call it the, uh, well, I don't actually have a name for it, but it, it's a trap when you have a big client who's like, I'm willing to give you money and yes. big bucks, but I need X, Y, Z. Yes. And then, and then your entire dev resource come, becomes servicing them. But guess what? At the end of the day, they're not going to be happy with you because you're not going to deliver properly on the X, Y, Z. And, no. And, and they're just going to be unhappy. You just wasted a bunch of resources on trying to make them happy because of the big bucks. And then you, in the process, pissed off all your other customers who were actually very happy with you. So yes. it's, it, I call that the, uh, actually, again, I don't have a name for it, but it's, a, it's, it's the, uh, let's come up with a name for it. I, I need to come up with one. But like, it's, it's the, the, it's the foul fantasy. The foul just, fantasy. Oh I'll call it the, the founder foul fantasy, which is like, Ooh, I got a big customer. I got to make them happy. Like if you're building something for airlines, like low budget airlines, and then all of a sudden United comes to you and says, I want this, but I want X, Y, Z. They're going to take you a completely different direction, right? So true. So well, I like I, that. I, once in a while, I, I can accept the, the concept of taking a bunch of money to develop some features for a big prospect, right? But But what really needs to be super clear is that those features that they need is super aligned with your product roadmap and Correct. that it benefits the rest and it will be available for the rest of your user base Correct. and it makes everything better. If it doesn't do that, hell no. Should be. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, there is also a different approach to, you know, you mentioned no code uh, or like even low code. I'm all, I'm a big believer in those. I, I think those are, those are a big one. Um, like, you know, we even we even help out our founders sometimes with it. Like it it yeah. just makes logical sense. Now that being said, though, going back to it, I don't think anyone should just build product. Like the like product is hard to build. So, what do you suggest from someone's perspective of you know they have no experience, they have no capabilities, they just know what the product needs to do. They don't necessarily know how to get there, how to do it, or whatnot. But what are your thoughts on that? So I, I, if that's like a solo entrepreneur, I would for sure say you got to team up with some product people because you like have, have the, what is it called? It's like the, have the hacker, the hustler and the hippie. The, the hacker. I like the <laughs> hacker. Okay, cool. Yeah. You definitely need the uh, hacker. That's for sure. Yeah. So I, I just heard it recently. I didn't know it. Uh, so don't, 
the like, so hold on, hold on. on the hacker uh, the hippie and what was the other one and the hustler the like hustler. the hustler basically getting the deals and the hacker being the tech one and the hippie i think is more like the product culture <laughs> culture <laughs> i'm a product guy i'm not a hippie so i don't know <laughs> uh, so i mean you you need to have a, a founder's team that that covers like both the commercial side and the product uh, like the development side and then the actual right. product uh, delivery right if you don't have that you're gonna be pretty challenged very quickly i had i was the commercial uh, lead and and my co-founder was the technical lead and then yeah. i also became the product lead so i was like doing two two of them um i think you can learn you? i just i i hesitate because there's so much that goes into product. And, and again, if you're using it for demo purposes, totally okay. That's actually preferred. Like you use that to just kind of show, hey, like here's what my the system will do for you. And here's how it would respond, right? Awesome, right? Um, I would suggest Figma because you can actually put more graphical design behind it. So you can actually make it look prettier. Because sure. sometimes that's hard to do on, on, on the no code stuff. But I'm, I'm such a believer in pre-selling I'm, I'm with you on that one. Like I'm such a believer in pre-selling. Yeah. Like pre-sell, pre-sell, pre-sell. If you're not even going to pre-sell, at least have those conversations, the product advisory board, right? Like have those yeah. conversations. So you understand what you're building. Like I remember we were building, we're building something right now and we were going to build. Um, and right now the problem too, is the market is quite saturated with a lot of software, right? Like Absolutely. you're in the SaaS business, like 13 years ago for you, Software was like, you can almost pump anything out and it would probably hit sure. somehow. Now, not a chance. There's <laughs> software for everything. So yeah. I always say like, what's your, what's your niche? What's your leverage? Yes. Right. And we were doing this product research for uh, one of the products that we were going to build. And we were like, okay, hey, this is kind of the route we want to take it. And we were like, okay, hey, let's go start talking to product advisory. And we, we collected, I think it was like eight product, eight. It wasn't even 10, right? We had eight guys that we talked to and we said, hey, like we're trying to build something like this. What are your thoughts? Like, is it useless? Like, is it pointless to do this? And they went, look, the number one thing I hate is X, Y, Z. And we, we were like, we went back to the drawing board. We're like, oh my <laughs> God, that changed everything because sure. we were going to take it this route. Because we thought this is what they're looking for. But they were like, no, 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 no. This part still hasn't been solved. And that's the biggest problem, right? Fair and enough. so you learn so much. I'm so with you on the pre-selling. Like, just have those conversations and understand what it is that people want. You'll be yeah. surprised what kind of information you get out of them. It can, it can be the reason why I'm like, in, what's extremely important in the pre-selling part is to ask for the money in the end. Because yes. you get the real truth there, not what what I'm always afraid of. If you just like, do, do you like do the transaction the right there? Like, do you do the yeah. transaction right there? Like, yeah, well, you know, put it. Okay, so car how? And... Okay, we have not had success with that. Like, we do talk to them about pricing. You rarely, you rarely actually sell, but you will get the objections. Yeah, and that's okay, the yeah, whole. That's what I thought. Thing. And because that's what we you, do. We we a yeah. focus group or something. So like, tell me what you think about this product. People are nice by default, right? Yeah. And and you can be misled into different directions because 100%. they don't want to say that what you just spend one and a half year on actually sucks. Yeah. So it's like, uh, but if no, you have money, yep. they will give you the truth. I, I'm with you with that. I always say, how much are you willing to pay for this? Like if I asked you to pay for this tomorrow, what would what would your price be? And yeah. I I have a little strategy. I, I don't know if it's a it's a public strategy or not but basically i say okay what is the price that this would become a no-brainer and they'll usually give you like i don't know if you charge me like 20 bucks in that month yeah that, that's a no-brainer i would always do that so sure. that's too low right then you say yeah. what's the price where this is just like way out of reach like there's just yeah. not enough value and benefit for you to pay for that and they'll say probably like like if you go anything above 100 bucks i wouldn't even bother Okay, now you found your peak, right? Sure. Now you know you're kind of sitting in the middle there, right? Like around that eighty dollars now, right? So that's yeah. how I kind of do it. Is like, what's a no brainer and what's too high, and then you can kind of fill. 
Because the pricing sure. as well, pricing strategy, in my opinion, it impacts your sales strategy significantly. But Absolutely. like a lot of startups, they underprice themselves. And when they underprice themselves, what, what ends up happening is like you're almost like running to get that as many deals as possible because you're trying to show volume. Whereas yes. you need to show revenue, not volume. Yes. Revenue is more important than volume. If you cut 20 of, if, if you raise your price by 20% and 10% leave, you've made more money. Exactly. Then you're good. <laughs> right? That, right? So and like if the other- you, If you 10X your price and you only like get like 50% less customers, you made a ton of money. Exactly. Suddenly, right? And you can do a whole other sales approach. Like you mentioned yourself, like now I can hire actual salespeople and not be completely dependent on this inbound uh, like on my onboarding flow that maybe is a bit on. broken or whatever like bang on and yeah we had uh we had one of our clients uh he, you know they were like well like we have these guys 10 companies like they're using our software i was like okay what's your what's the total amount like how many users do they have oh they have 43 i was like that's one customer <laughs> like on average yeah. you're getting one customer that's doing about 50 users so True. And you're charging double the price of that guy. Why do you care if you keep that one customer with 10 companies? Who cares about the 10 companies? They only have 43 users. You want more yeah. users. Users are better. <laughs> yes. right? So I, I actually had that conversation with a, with a SaaS founder the other day because she was like, how should I price my SaaS product? Yeah. And pricing is like, tough. Super, it's, it's a tricky one. And, yeah. and she was super early stage, had some uh, test customers like using her platform. I was like, Sorry, but your real challenge right now is not if you should price it at a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, but it's getting getting the people Traction. to use your platform and keep coming back and making sure that you keep solving that pain for them. If you nail that, then you can start to put the price yeah. a lot, lot higher, right? Yeah. Then she yeah. was actually starting out at it's like your problem is solving maybe like a hundred thousand dollar challenge for this customer yeah and you're and you're charging ten dollars like doesn't matter in the beginning get the users in then you yeah. can price it out massively up i agree with that uh, the first challenge is your product that's your pre-seed seed is your market you have to show that people are willing to pay for this product now yes. how much it is is a different story and i think people get into the pricing way too early i agree with you um, anyways, Kristen, thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate you, especially right now. What time is it over there right now in Denmark? It's seven in the evening. Okay. All right. So it's not that bad, but I, I still, I appreciate you joining us in the evening. Uh, I'm sure you have, uh, meals and kid and, and, uh, and the wife to go back to. So I do really appreciate you taking the time with us here today. Um, I, I think, I think what you said was super valuable to our, our founders and our community. So I really, I really thank you for that. My pleasure being here, man. Really awesome. loved it. Awesome. Um, to everybody back at home, and thank you for listening to the Founders Corner. If you know anyone that might take some benefit from this, please do share. Um, otherwise, like and subscribe. And until next time, Corridor out. <laughs>